scripture reading this morning. Our first lesson is from the Old Testament book of 1 Samuel, chapter 16, beginning at verse 1 through verse 13. Now the Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I am sending you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided myself a king among his sons. And Samuel said, Well, how can I go? If Saul hears it, he will kill me. But the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. And then invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do. You shall anoint for me the one I name to you. So Samuel did what the Lord said and went to Bethlehem. And the elders of the town trembled at his coming and said, Do you come peacefully? And he said, Peaceably I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. So it was when they came that he looked at Eliab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. And then Jesse made Shammah pass by. And he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Thus Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen these. And Samuel said to Jesse, Are all the young men here? And then he said, Well, there remains yet the youngest, and there he is, keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. And so he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy with bright eyes and good looking. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him. This is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers and the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. And so Samuel arose and went to Ramah. Here ends our Old Testament reading. Our epistle lesson today is from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 6 through 16. Spiritual wisdom. However, we speak wisdom among those who are mature. Yet not the wisdom of this age, nor of the rulers of this age, who are coming to nothing. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew. For had they known, they would have not crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, eye has not seen, ear has not heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us through the Holy Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. These things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him nor can he know them 
because they are spiritually discerned. But he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Here ends the reading. This morning's gospel comes from the book of John, chapter 9, verses 24 through 38. And so they again called the man who was blind and said to him, Give God the glory. We know that this man is a sinner. And he answered and said, Whether he is a sinner or not, I do not know. One thing I know, that though I was blind, now I see. And then they said to him again, well, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? And he answered them, I told you already, and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? Then they reviled him and said, You are his disciple, but we are Moses' disciples. We know that God spoke to Moses. As for this fellow, we do not know where he is from. And the man answered and said to them, Why? This is a marvelous thing that you do not know where he is from, and yet he has opened my eyes. Now we know that God does not hear sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, he hears him. Since the world began, it has been unheard of that anyone opened the eyes of one who was born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered and said to him, You were completely born in sins. And are you teaching us? And they cast him out. Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and when he had found him, he said to him, Do you believe in the Son of God? And he answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? And Jesus said to him, You have both seen him, and it is he who is talking with you. Then he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. Here ends our reading. Let us pray this morning before the preaching of God's word today. Lord God, we pray that as we prepare for the, to hear this message this morning and as I prepare to proclaim to you the law and gospel today, we pray that our eyes would be attentive to your word, that we would be focused on you, that our ears would be opened. Lord God, that each part of our being would be concentrating on who you are and what you have done for us in your son jesus christ our lord so bless us as we explore your word today in jesus name we pray amen in lutheranism and many other kinds of protestantism we refer to the mother of our lord we simply call her mary or sometimes we call her the virgin mary i can't think of a time in our context unlike the catholic church where we refer to mary as saint mary i can't think of any church named saint mary's lutheran church or saint mary's presbyterian church or whatever but it's strange when you think of it because we refer to others in the new testament with that title saint paul saint peter saint james and i'm not just talking about the cities in minnesota we're referring to the apostles now another thing that's interesting about the saints as we think about them and we observe their remembrances in the calendar of the year that we often don't refer to the old testament believers the examples in faith as being saints even though they did many godly things we don't talk about saint moses saint noah saint elijah and so it seems a little strange to us to think of the old testament examples of faith as being people that we would set aside a specific day to remember. Now, in the Eastern Orthodox Church, the Eastern churches, they have more of a tradition of this. And on their calendar, they remember names like Moses and Isaiah. And even the Lutheran Church, Missouri Senate, our brothers and sisters in the faith there, have picked up on this. And in their hymnal, too, they observe the Old Testament examples of faith and have a day set aside for them. And so this past Friday, August 20th, was the commemoration of the life of of Samuel the prophet. Now Samuel is one of those who played a very significant role 
in the Old Testament. Very significant role, but yet we don't think about him or talk about him that much. Now, if I were to ask you about Noah, you could probably give me the story. If I were to ask you about Moses, you could probably give me part of the story. But I imagine that a number of you, and certainly many more in our greater context, would have very little to say about Samuel. But yet, he was very important in his life, like so many others of these Old Testament examples or saints or whatever word you want to use. Their, their lives were signs that they, were, they pointed towards the life of Christ that they were examples that showed us that they taught theological truths that all come together in the life of Jesus Christ. And so, of course, Samuel is one of these men whose life points forward to the coming of the Savior. Now, in the first way that we can see this in the Scriptures, and it's very obvious when you take the text and compare them and look at them, is how Samuel and Mary, how their response to their pregnancy. Now, Mary, of course, was just a young girl and who was in no way looking to become a mother at that tender age. But the Lord had other plans for her. Unlike Samuel's mother, Hannah, who went to Shiloh each year and prayed fervently that God would answer her prayer and to give him a son. And Lord, if you if you would give me a son, I will dedicate him as a Nazarite. He can be in service to you all the days of his life. And the prophet Eli saw her praying and thought that, you know, she was drunk because she was praying so fervently, but she was praying to God silently and she wasn't making any sound. So as we examine her reaction and Mary's reaction, their responses are very similar. I mean, similar concepts, similar words used, a joyful exaltation of the lowly, the triumph of the humble over the proud, and hope for the nation of Israel. Now, besides the disposition of their mothers, we see how Samuel's life foreshadows Christ in similar work. Samuel was the last of the judges, and he was a prophet. He was a priest in a sense because he offered up sacrifices to God. While Samuel ruled with political power, he was never a king, but he certainly was a king maker. And so it is unsurprising then that when Israel wanted to have a real king with a crown upon his head, that Samuel, the one who had been the leader felt like he had been rejected. The Lord had to console Samuel. The Lord consoled Samuel with the words, they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me. For Samuel 8, 7. And so Samuel was able to be rehabilitated to his role of being an influential member of society, and he did then find kings for Israel to have. We also see some parallels here of how Samuel's life points to Christ and some other details of their life, that Samuel was a Nazarite, as I briefly mentioned, that his mother had prayed so fervently for his birth that she dedicated him to the Lord. And that's a special vow that exists in the Old Testament, that they would not drink of any wine, that they would not cut their hair, and that they would uh, be dedicated to God. And then Jesus, of course, did not have this vow upon him. But he was not a Nazarite, but he was from Nazareth. And people have liked to play with that as well. Now, even it's quite the opposite, that the Pharisees accused Jesus of being an imbiber of wine. Because Jesus was not one who was an imbiber of wine to excess, but that he ate and drank with those who were on the margins of society. And so he was one who reached out. That he was holy, but yet he was able to communicate with those who were around him. And so we see here again that there are these details that show forth that in the life of Samuel, something was working greater to come to the life of Christ. And so we begin to examine Samuel's life, and as he takes up this role again, and his, he anoints Saul to become the first king of Israel, he's taken in by Saul, because Saul looks like the perfect king. The scriptures talk about him being a head taller than every other man, that he was a good-looking fellow. And so Samuel anointed Saul, and Saul then began his rule. And in his rule, that the life of David began to come into his life. And it's interesting as we were to, if we were to examine that. We don't have time for that, of course, today. But it's just interesting to see how right from the beginning, when David is this little boy taking his slingshot, throwing against Goliath, and defeating the Philistines, that David becomes more important and Saul becomes less important. Almost kind of like John the Baptist and Jesus in that sense, that I must decrease, he must increase. 
Saul even gives his daughter Michal in marriage. And his son Jonathan was really good friends with David. We think again here too briefly that Samuel like, was a judge. He was a kingmaker and he was a prophet and all those kind of things, but he also was a judge. He had some political authority. Now Jesus, of course, is not a judge with earthly authority. As Jesus said to Pilate in his passion, he said, my kingdom is not of this world. But Christ certainly is a judge, even though he has never worn any black outfit, that he will come again in power and great glory to judge both the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We also think, once again, of how Samuel's life and Jesus' life are related, and that Samuel's life points towards Christ, and that Samuel spent his early years in the tabernacle, that his mother was so grateful for his birth that she dedicated him to serve Eli in the tabernacle. Jesus did not live in the tabernacle or the temple by that time that it had developed, but what did Jesus do when he was a young boy? One of the very few stories we have of his early years, that Jesus at a young age interacted with the teachers of the law, and he said, I needed to be in my father's house. I needed to be doing my father's business. So here we see again that how one life points towards the other. And finally, that Jesus was called a prophet too. We don't no normally think of Jesus as being a prophet because we have so many other names for him, like king or shepherd or redeemer or savior, but he certainly was a prophet, and they called him as such. And Samuel was a judge and a prophet, but he also was a seer, S-E-E-R. And that means a person who can see into the future, who can divine certain things that are coming, just like he knew whom to anoint to be the king's of Israel. Now it's interesting that Samuel, although he was a seer, one who could observe things that other people can't, that when he was called, he was not called by a vision like so many of the other stories of Scripture talk about. That Samuel was called in the night. When the Lord called Samuel as a young boy in God's house, called him to service, and he goes to Eli, and, and why were you calling me, Eli? And he says, I didn't call you. Go back to bed. And finally, the third time, Eli tells him, it must be the Lord. So if you hear this voice again, say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel, when he was called, was called in a sense like a blind man because he didn't see anything. He simply heard the call. And so that was the beginning of his service. Now, Samuel's work was visible as it worked out through time. And, of course, when anointing Saul to be the king. And Saul had very specific instructions that he had received from Samuel. This wasn't some advisory role. That Samuel, as a prophet, as a seer, he had a specific word to Saul. And his order for Saul was that the Amalekites, this nation battle against Israel, they need to be all destroyed, each and every one of them. We're not even talking about soldiers on the battlefield. Take them all out. Women children, even their animals, don't leave anything behind. It says in the scripture that they had treated the Israelites poorly, and this was God's execution of justice upon the Amalekites. And of course, just like it hit us right now, that sounds like a drastic order, does it not? It sounds so extreme, but these were the orders that Samuel had communicated to Saul. And Saul did not follow the plan as he was supposed to. The scriptures tell us that he was victorious in battle, but he didn't take out everybody. He saved the life of the king, his name was Agag, and he saved some of the choicest livestock, thinking, I'm going to sacrifice this livestock unto God, and God is even going to be more pleased with what I have done. But it was this final transgression that made the Lord turn away from the throne of Saul. And the scriptures even say something that we don't see very often or hear very often in the Bible, that it says that the Lord regretted having made Saul king. Now, we, that's a very drastic phrase to think about, that the Lord, the one who knows all things and who, whose will you know, governs the world, that he regretted having made Saul king. And so Samuel then arrives to tell Saul, that he will no longer be king. And he, Saul had also made the sacrifice without Samuel being there, and that was another breaking of the rules. And so the Lord took away Saul's right to be king. And Samuel took this hard because here he was the one that didn't really want to give them a king in the first place. Samuel didn't want to give 
Israel a king, he had wanted them to trust in God. But God had told him, no, they haven't rejected you, they rejected me. So he finally adjusted to the situation and he anointed Saul king. But now that's going to be taken away too. And this is where we come to our scripture reading today, that Old Testament lesson. The opening words were of God asking Samuel, how long are you going to mourn for Saul, seeing that I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Samuel was grieving. Yet the Lord had another work for Samuel. And as his work as a seer, as one who can observe things that other people can't, the Lord led him to the family of Jesse. And we heard that secession of sons who were presented before Samuel. The first one was Eliab, and right away Samuel thinks, this is the one, he, has, he looks the part just like Saul. No, then God tells him, no, he's not the one. Oh, then Shammah, then Abinadab. But it was David, the one who the father Jesse didn't even consider showing to Samuel because, well, he's just the young one. He's not ready for anything like that. He's a shepherd boy. He's out in the field. He's dirty. But as our scripture reading today tells us, it was not the physical characteristics that qualified David to be king, even though David was also a good-looking figure. And the point is clearly communicated in the text. It says that he was ruddy, that his eyes were bright, but it wasn't his looks. It wasn't him looking royal that qualified him, but it was that God had looked upon his heart and could see something that was in him that was not present in the others. And so Samuel then anointed David to be the king. We take this text here, and we see how Samuel's life and him anointing David and all these things point towards Jesus Christ and the New Testament. And some of these, again, are fairly obvious. Like we think of when the blind man Bartimaeus, another blind man, not the one in our scripture text today, I'm jumping ahead here, but there's this other blind man in the scriptures that one time when Jesus was passing by, this man, his name is Bartimaeus, tells us in the book of Luke that he said, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. So here, the connection's being made that this, here's another blind man who had no formal education, but yet he knew who Jesus was. But the religious leaders, they could not figure out who Jesus was. Even though they knew all about Samuel, they knew all about the Old Testament, they were scholars, they had read and taught these things, they were spiritually blind. They could not see who Jesus is. Now, it's interesting as well that when we examine the story in the New Testament, now moving to our gospel text, that this first blind man, the one who uh, was healed by Jesus, not asking for to be healed, but Jesus saw him and ministered to him and opened his eyes, that this man is not remembered by name. There's no name given for this man here in John chapter 9. It's here again in the Eastern tradition of the church that for whatever reason, they have assigned him a name just to make it easier to reference him. And his name is called Seludonius. And it's interesting that in the Eastern tradition that when they speak about this Seludonius being healed, that it wasn't just that his eyes were restored so that he could see again like he had had vision and had lost it in o older age. But when he's portrayed in art, that he's portrayed before his healing as having no eyes at all. Like he was born without eyes entirely. And so then when Jesus spat on the ground and mixed the dirt with spittle and put it in his eyes, that it was almost like a new creation, that this man was receiving something, a new sight that was making him see something that nobody else around him could see. But whatever the circumstances was of this man, whether he was born with eyes or without, Jesus healed him and this man knew that he had been changed. It was very obvious for him. As the Pharisees were interrogating him, you know, who is this man and what has he done to you and how did he do it and why did he do it and all these questions, he isn't really able to answer them. He just said to them those simple words, once I was blind, now I see. And of course the Pharisees are not taken in by this. They want something more academic. They want something more tied to the tradition because they are thinking that they are the ones who are faithfully carrying on the tradition. And of course, they did not carry on the tradition. They couldn't see how it all pointed towards Jesus Christ. And so the Pharisees asked Jesus sort of a tongue-in-cheek question. They asked Jesus, are we blind then too? And Jesus responded to them with few words. He said, your sin remains. 
The one who was healed, who could never see anything, maybe was never even born with eyes, saw everything that there was needed to be seen, both physical and spiritual. And Christ, when he talked to them, this man came to understand quickly. When Jesus found him after he had been harassed, and Jesus asked him, do you believe? Do you believe? And the man says, I could see now. And then Jesus starts talking to this man about himself, and he speaks about himself in the third person. Do you know this man? And the man says, I do not know. Tell me, Lord. And then Jesus says, I who speak to you am he. So we see that in his blindness, that he was able to perceive and see greater things than the most learned man in the world could know. Now, we have the advantage for us that we know these stories. We know how Jesus is going to throw them into a box, them into a corner, and how the Pharisees are not going to know how to respond. So what kinds of things then can we take away from this? You already know this morning that Jesus is the son of David. You know the Christmas story and how Jesus was born in Bethlehem just like David was from Bethlehem. And David was a shepherd boy and Jesus is a shepherd boy. You know those kinds of things. So what are some of the things that we can take away? And some of the lessons aren't overly theological, but they still are important for your life. One of them, of course, the obvious lesson is don't judge a book by its cover. Or don't judge a king by his appearance. Saul looked the part, but he made mistakes. And Samuel was almost going to make that same mistake, if you will, that he was going to anoint another one of Jesse's sons, Eliab, to be the king because he looked the part. And he wasn't going to even consider, and his dad wasn't even going to consider David to be worth anointing. But his qualification was of the heart. So don't judge a king by his appearances. Don't judge a book by its cover. Another lesson, also not necessarily spiritual, but in other cases, very spiritual and theological. Be careful whom you perceive as being your enemies and your competition. Sometimes the folks that you think who are your enemies in life are the ones who are simply just competing because they have the same interests as you. The Pharisees saw Jesus as competition. They couldn't take anything from him because they were worried that he was going to usurp them. They wanted to kill him because all the world was chasing after him. Same thing even with King Herod, too. He wanted to take Jesus out right away because he viewed him as competition. But when you view others as enemies, you might be simply making enemies without any reason. Jesus tells us to love our enemies, to pray for those who persecute us. And these are important lessons to learn too because you never know as things and circumstances in your life change. I'm sure each one of you could think of somebody in your life who you didn't like at first. And you viewed that person as a threat to you and maybe you realize through conversation, well, this person just seems like a, I think I just found this person to be a threat because he or she wants the same things that I want, and maybe if we work together, we can, we can make something happen. Our human pride and our selfishness so often wants to see those who are around us, especially in our families, our spouse, or the rivalries between siblings, that kind of thing. That never Be careful who you perceive as your enemies and your competition. And we also need to be reminded of this in the spiritual realm, too, that, that so often we think of those who are against us as being only an earthly power. But we are reminded in the scriptures that our battles are not against principalities and powers. That though we may be small in number and few and without any earthly resources, that in Christ Jesus that you have authority over the devil himself. And so keep in mind who your enemies and your competition are. And even though something might really be troubling you and some temptation might be really knocking at your door, Remember that you have the Lord of the universe in your corner. And that is something to not forget. Another lesson that we can learn this morning is that we are all sinners. Each one of us. Now Saul's sins were fairly obvious. That he followed his own agenda instead of doing what Samuel had instructed him to do. But even Samuel wasn't perfect either. You have to kind of dig a little bit to find something about Samuel. But Samuel, I should just briefly explain this story so it makes sense. It will be brief. When Samuel died, and then Saul was still in the trying to hold on to his own power. And so Saul goes to a witch to try to communicate with Samuel 
what should I do? And he goes to the seance, and Samuel is awakened from his sleep. And Samuel really is cranky with Saul. Why have you awakened me, woken me from my rest? So we can even see that in moments like this, when his opinion was so valued that he was willing to go to a, a necromancer, that even Samuel was rude to him at that point. So even Samuel was not perfect, even though he was God's servant, that he had his blemishes as well. And he had felt rejected, of course, too. We can remember that, that he wasn't trusting in God with everything, that he was lamenting that he had chosen these kings and it seemed like it had come to nothing and he had failed. No, that wasn't the case. The real rejection that we should keep in mind is the rejection of God. That is the true rejection. Not any earthly rejection. Each one of you have probably experienced some rejection in your life, whether your children hate you or your brother and sister don't like you or your parents abandon you. Whatever the case may be, we have each been rejected. And you could think of your own circumstance. The, the greatest rejection is the rejection that Jesus felt when he was despised by the world. As uh, Luke chapter 10, verse 16 tells us that whoever listens to you, Jesus said, listens to me. Whoever rejects you, rejects me. Whoever rejects me, rejects the one who sent me. 1 John chapter 2, verse 23, whoever denies the Son does not have the Father. Everyone who denies the Son not only does that, but does not possess the Father. To deny that Jesus is the Christ is to deny the Son of God, for the Christ is the incarnate Son. And to deny the Son of God is to deny the Father also. That is the rejection to fear the most. And it is something that you need not fear. You need not fear God passing you by, as we sang in that hymn uh, this morning. That God graciously calls you to be with him, to come with me. Come, I go to prepare a place for you, Jesus said. But so often we have our own agenda. We're like Saul and want to do things our own ways versus doing it God's ways. And finally this morning, an important lesson to take away is that sacrifice needs to be sacrificial. It has to cost you something. See, Saul didn't understand that. He was trying to maximize his value out of this experience. He was going to take out the Amalekites, plus he was going to get some good livestock and you know, sacrifice them up to God, and it would even be a greater thing. But that was not the order that he had received from Samuel. Saul had been told by Samuel, take them all out. And we remember again how extreme it was. Not just the soldiers, but the women, the children, and the livestock. Because sacrifice has to involve everything. As the scriptures say in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. And we see this in the scripture. We think of Abel and Cain with their sacrifice. That, that Abel's sacrifice was acceptable to God because he was a farmer. But Cain's sacrifice was not acceptable because he was only a tender of the field. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. And so it is then that Jesus had to die. That just as the Amalekites, for whatever reason that we don't quite understand, it seems horrible to us that to take them all out. But that is only even just a picture of the horror that Jesus experienced too. That he was the one sent by the Father. That he was the one who knew no sin. Who took all sin upon himself. The one who loves you with everything in his very being. And yet you despise him and betray him every day. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Let's pray about that this morning. Lord God, Heavenly Father, what an interesting passage of Scripture as we think this morning in these two lessons, thinking of Samuel and how you called him at such a young age to dedicate his life to you, Lord, that his mother Hannah set him in that path, but Lord, that your prophet Samuel followed in that vocation seriously and how he cared for Israel and how he even uh, anointed rulers to be kings even though he didn't want to. And Lord, as we think on those rulers today and Saul and, and David who were very short in some of their performances, Lord, in being faithful to you. But Lord, that you still work through them and Lord, that you still are opening eyes and that you are still working all throughout uh, history. And we think, Lord, of this man today whose name we don't really know for sure, whose eyes were opened by Jesus Christ 
and that he was able to see something that the religious leaders could not observe whatsoever. So Lord, we pray that as we look at this world and as we see how so much of the world just wants to pass you by and has no interest in discerning anything spiritual, Lord God, we pray that our eyes would continue to be sensitive to the things that you have to communicate to us. So Lord God, we pray that amidst all the trials and troubles that we have, just as uh, we examine these troubles today with this man who had no sight and Saul who had all his personal problems and jealousies, Lord, that we each have one of those, we each have those issues too. But Lord, that you still listen to our prayers, that you call us to cast each of our cares upon you and to trust in you even when we don't understand everything that's happening. Lord, this world is so confusing in all its complexities. But Lord, you have made known to us what we need to know, your son, Jesus Christ and how that gives us hope amidst all the confusion of the world. So help us, Lord God, to to be faithful and to follow you. And when we fail to do so, Lord God, that we would trust in your grace and your mercy won for us on Calvary by the one who knew no sin, who became sin for us. Because as we remember, Lord God, this morning, without the remission, without the sacrifice of blood, there is no remission of sins and how costly that sacrifice is. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.